Hello, and uh, so last time we talked about the neuromuscular junction and the events that occurred at the neuromuscular junction, and I kind of ended uh, up talking about an action potential. I wanted to kind of start right there and, and talk just a little bit more about the action potential. So the changes in, in voltage uh, in the interior of the muscle cell you, and, and also the nerve cell, you can actually measure that with a little microvoltmeter, and uh, you can look at it on an oscilloscope or a computer screen. And the reading that you get when an action potential crosses a certain point of a muscle cell, that change in electrical charge, you can actually see it on, on, an, on an oscilloscope as you can see down here. I've drawn the little graph for you um, on this little region down here. Let me get my pen out here and uh, we can take a look at that. So, so I've drawn for you the action potential as seen on the oscilloscope. You can see that millivolts is the y-axis and it's positive 30 and negative 70. Milliseconds is the is the um, is the uh, x-axis. So um, at resting state all of our cells at resting state are around negative 70 millivolts ish. Different cells have, have a different voltage. And that negative 70 millivolts is is actually created by these particular um, little channels that are in the membrane. And potassium channels leak potassium out, sodium channels leak sodium in, and the sodium potassium pump, you know, every time it works, it pumps out three sodium for every two potassium it brings in. So the cumulative activity of all of these particular parts is going to lead to that resting state potential of negative 70 millivolts. What's special about muscle cells and nerve cells is they have voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium channels that aid in changing the interior voltage. So, you know, maybe last lecture I was a little clunky on explaining that. I wanted to make sure I, fur I, I further explained that. If given a stimulus, if the muscle cell is given a stimulus, that stimulus would be a neurotransmitter opening up, opening up those sodium channels. As sodium flows in, there are voltage-gated sodium channels that once you get to a certain voltage, they begin to open up in large amounts. And so the voltage-gated sodium channels are going to be in the membrane of the muscle cell, and they're going to cause the interior voltage to become positive because it's going to flood with the with the um, with the sodium ions, which are positively charged. And this overwhelms all of these leak channels that are over here so that you get a rise in charge. At the same time, but delayed just a little bit, the voltage-gated uh, potassium channels are going to also open as well, but it's delayed by a millisecond or so. So by the time the voltage-gated sodium channels close, you get a rise to positive 30 millivolts. Of positive charge, but these potassium voltage-gated channels are going to open up as well. And if you notice the arrow, so from the interior of the cell to the exterior, potassium's begin going to begin to be uh, pumped out or or flow out, and that's going to cause the 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 uh, charge, the voltage charge, to go down to you know below negative 70 millivolts. This is called a hyperpolarization. Well, eventually those channels, those potassium voltage-gated potassium channels will close, and that will then allow for the resting state potential to be redone or, re or maintained by all these other little potassium leak channels, sodium leak channels, and sodium potassium pump. So I just wanted to clarify that a little bit more. And so it, you know, it will be worth your time and effort to kind of think about this and, and get this arranged in your mind. Because when we go to the nervous system, we're going to come back and talk more about these leak channels, the voltage-gated channels, potassium voltage-gated channels, and, uh, and what we see on an oscilloscope. So go ahead and, and get that in your memory banks so that we can come back and talk about that again. All right, so now we can dive into talking about steps to the muscle contraction. So as the action potential spreads across the sarcolemma, as that change in voltage spreads across the sarcolemma, it eventually dives deep into the muscle cell because of those transverse tubules. That's how it dives deep in. Now, the, the, there, there are voltage-sensitive proteins in the T-tubules that line the, the T-tubules, and they're zippered with calcium channels that are embedded in the, the membranes of the terminal cisternae, and that's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And I'm going to show you pictures of this in just a second. I'm just going to kind of outline it for you in kind of a notes uh, note steps. 
Um, when the action potential reaches those voltage sensitive proteins, that change in voltage is going to cause them to change shape. And that shape change is going to open up the calcium channels so they can release massive amounts of calcium into the cytosol of the, of the muscle cell um, and then spread across the myofibrils. So just kind of showing you a couple pictures of what that looks like. So, so here we have the, the, the microtube, uh, excuse me, the transverse tubules. They go deep into the muscle cell and they're intimately connected to and zippered with proteins of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we're going to see that in just one second. Notice that the sarcoplasmic reticulum spreads across the myofibrils and they're going to be full of calcium that's going to be dumped on the myofibrils. Here's that picture that has the sarcolemma. It then has the sarcolemma, the, the transverse tubule diving deep. Here are those little zippered proteins. Those are the proteins that are voltage sensitive that are zippered with the uh, with the calcium uh, the calcium channels. Okay. So as your positive charge dives deep down, so as the interior becomes positive because you have voltage gated sodium channels all along the edge there. So as those voltage gated sodium channels allow positive charge to flow in, it changes the shape of those, those voltage sensitive proteins, which will then, since they're zippered with and intimately connected with the calcium channels, they can open up the calcium channels. So here is, is a resting state. So this is at rest. But if you change the interior to being positive, you get a shape change of that voltage sensitive protein. And since it's zippered with or intimately connected with the calcium channel, uh, you can see the calcium channel here is closed. But if I change the shape of this voltage sensitive protein, it changes the shape of the calcium channel, allowing calcium to flood outside and to flood around the myofibril. Just, just showing you different, just a different, uh, a different uh, way of looking at it. So we have the action potential coming down. It's causing the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That calcium is going to join that regulatory protein called troponin that is connected to tropomyosin. When troponin joins with calcium, it rolls tropomyosin off of these little binding sites that are here in purple. So all of those binding sites are being closed right now. They're closed off so myosin can't grab a hold of it. But once those little uh, once tropomyosin rolls off of that, myosin can then join with actin, and then we can get you know a muscle beginning to think about contracting. So calcium binds to troponin, that little regulatory protein, and it removes the blocking action of tropomyosin. And then you're going to get the myosin, which is in a cocked or energized form. It will attach to the actin myofilament and, and cause what we call a cross bridge or a physical connection. Now, um, when ADP and inorganic phosphate are released from myosin, and I'll show you how it attaches in, in one second. When inorganic phosphate and ADP are uh, released from myosin, the myosin head will pivot or bend and it changes from a low energy shape, uh, changes to its low energy shape. This is going to slide, that bending slides the actin filament towards the M line. Okay, so if these are actin filaments, this is the M line, these are the thick filaments, actin is going to be pulled in this way so that the Z lines are going to get closer together. Okay, that's what's going to cause a muscle contraction to occur. After ATP attaches to the myosin, the link between myosin is going and actin will weaken, and the myosin head will detach. Okay, so um, so the myosin can attach to actin and can detach to actin, but you have to have ATP in order for that to occur. As the ATP is hydrolyzed, as the uh, as it uh, is broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate, the myosin will become cocked and it will become in its high energy form. And I'll show you pictures of what that looks like in one second. So here is uh, here's actin. So this is actin up here, and this is myosin right here. Myosin has in all three dimensions the little head like club like heads that are sticking out. You can see in this particular uh, view, tropomyosin is blocking the active sites on actin, so troponin hasn't touched calcium. So myosin can't grab a hold of actin in this particular graphic here. 
but in the contraction cycle, you can see that um, that uh, in, uh, in in this particular one, we can start anywhere here. Let's start here where the myosin head hydrolyzes ATP and becomes cocked. So here we have the cocked form. Myosin is going to uh, go ahead and uh, bind to actin forming a cross bridge. So you can see it joining with actin forming a cross bridge. Myosin cross bridge will rotate, so the the the, the head will um, will basically go this way, and it pulls actin in this dimension. ATP is, has to be uh, attached to myosin so that it can detach from actin. It can then you know hydrolyze again and and get back into its high energy form and grab a hold again and keep on pulling on actin but you have to have ATP if we don't have ATP then the cross bridges will never be broken and the muscles will be locked together this happens in death it's called rigor mortis so at death you don't produce ATP anymore and the muscles become locked and as decomposition occurs over the next couple of days um, the, the little cross links will be broken from decomposition this is just showing a little a little animation there. There's troponin, calcium's coming down, ATP's joining, ATP is going to be hydrolyzed. So we have calcium coming down here, tropomyosin is rolling off of the binding sites, myosin in its cocked form can grab a hold and then pull it. So actin was pulled this way. ATP comes in and uh, and releases the cross bridge. So what uh, what occurs you can see under the electron microscope and, and uh, so on the left hand side over over on the left hand side over here you have artist rendition and you have electron microscopy. So what happens is that I want you to look at the sarcomere. So as the actin is pulled in this way you can see that the sarcomeres begin to shorten, so they shorten. Notice what happens to the I band. The I band disappears. The A band is going to get darker. So here we have the I band, here we have the A band. As you have a muscle contraction, the A band darkens up. There's the M line right there. But the I band disappears because you have an overlap of the myosin and actin filaments. Okay, so look at artist rendition, see what happens to actin as it's pulled across, see what happens to the Z-line, and then we can see that through physical evidence, um, through electron microscopy, you can visually see that the uh, Z-lines are getting closer together. And when the Z-lines all get closer together, it makes the myofibril shorter. The myofibril is connected to the membrane of the muscle cell because of that dystrophin, and it contracts and shortens the muscle cell, which again then eventually pulls on the tendon. This is just showing you how actin's pulled in, the Z-lines are getting closer together, and then this is a muscle relaxation, the Z-lines get further apart. Now, there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between motor neurons and muscle cells, but typically we have what we call a motor unit. So the motor unit is where you have one motor neuron that connects to or contacts many muscle fiber cells. So um, you can see there's a lot of neuromuscular junctions here. So this one motor neuron is servicing all of these muscle cells. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11 of those. So it's a 1 to 11 relationship in that particular example. Um, and there's different motor, new, motor neurons depending upon what the muscle is needing to do. So muscles of the larynx have a two to three muscle fibers per motor unit. So one motor neuron will contact two or three muscle cells. So you get pretty fine control movement there um, in, in those particular muscle cells. If you look at uh, muscles of the eyes, you might have 10 to 20 muscle fibers per motor unit. And then muscles of the biceps brachii and gastrocnemius, you might have 2,000 to 3,000 um, muscles per motor unit. So not a lot of fine control there compared to the fine control you have in the larynx. This is just showing microscopically what a motor unit looks like. You can see here's the motor neuron axon coming down. Here's a neuromuscular junction, neuromuscular junction. You can see it's contacting many muscle fibers. 
All right, kind of switching gears a little bit, um, you know, we can see that the force of contraction versus action potentials. So as an action potential comes to a, to a muscle cell, you get a contraction of the muscle cell. The more frequent muscle uh, neuro, uh, action potentials get, the more the muscle cell, the more forceful the contraction will get. So the more information sent from the brain to the muscle cell, the more and more forceful the contraction will get. And eventually you can send so many signals from the neuro, motor neuron, uh, so many action potentials that the muscle cell really gets to where it's highly contracted. So the force contraction will be really, really great. And at some point, you know, it'll, it will be overwhelmed and won't be able to maintain that contraction. But those are called myograms. So, um, so, so the brief contraction of all muscle fibers in a motor unit in response to a single action potential is, uh, is a twitch. And uh, you can see that there from, from the front, so this is the force of contraction, this is time in milliseconds. So as you get the first signal, you get a latent period, then you get a contraction period where the muscle cells are fully contracted, you get a relaxation period, so there's, there's actually, you know, a graphical display you can make of a muscle twitch as you're, as you're getting more and more signaling from the action potential. So, um, so wave summation occurs when a second action potential triggers muscle contraction before the first has finished. So you can get stronger and stronger contractions if you get more and more signaling after the first initial signaling. And we have different names that we use for that. Unfused tetanus and fused tetanus depend upon how many. So here's your unfused tetanus and then a fused tetanus. It just depends on how many action potentials follow and how with the frequency or time that they follow the first action potential. Even at rest, a mu muscle cell exhibits a small amount of tension. This is called muscle tone. And... Uh, and uh, this is due to, to weak involuntary contractions of motor units. So our muscles are primed to go. They're toned all the time, ready to go um, because of these little weak um, involuntary uh, signaling that's given over. So there are different kinds of tensions that you can uh, create. Isotonic is a tension that is constant while the muscle length changes. So a concentric um, contraction is going to be like lifting a book. So the, there is tension, constant tension, uh, and but the length of the muscle is changing. Eccentric is where you're lowering a book, where the muscle tension is the same, but the muscle um, length is changing. Isometric is where the muscle contracts, but does not change in length. So you can just squeeze the muscle and contract it, but if it doesn't change in length, we call that an isometric contraction. So there's different kinds of contractions that you can make. So here would be the, uh, the concentric contractions where you're lifting a book, so the muscle's changing. Eccentric is where the muscle is changing in length and it's maintaining tension. And then if you're just holding a book outright, that's an isometric contraction. Now muscles have to have energy, so they have to metabolize uh, food substances in order to get their energy. And uh, there's a problem with this. Muscle cells store between four to six seconds worth of ATP. And ATP is the only energy that muscle cells use in order to do a muscle contraction. So that's a, that's a little bit of a problem there. Um, you know, you can do an activity where you can control or contract your muscle more than four to six seconds. So there must be ways of generating energy and we'll wanna talk about those ways. ATP is the only energy source used for contraction. So there are three ways that you can regenerate ATP. ATP, if you remember, is a rechargeable battery. Uh, it's a, you, know, you can use energy that is stored in it, and then you can recharge that energy um, after you use it. So there are ways you can regenerate ATP. One, one of them is the direct phosphorylation, that is the transfer of, um, of a phosphate group from creatine phosphate to ADP. So thus, you know, recharging uh, the ADP into ATP. So um, creatine kinase is the enzyme that transfers a phosphate group from creatine phosphate to ADP, and it does it very, very rapidly. So we do have an enzyme that can, that can take energy from creatine phosphate, phosphates from creatine phosphate, and transfer them to ADP so that you can make ATP. 
the amount of available energy liberated by creatine phosphate is about 15 seconds worth. So you can recharge ATP for about 15 seconds and get a little bit more energy or usage out of your muscle cell. So at rest, you will replenish this creatine phosphate, and this is what it looks like. So here's creatine. Here's uh, creatine phosphate over here. At rest, you can take ATP and uh, take a phosphate group from ATP and put it onto creatine, uh, into, onto creatine to, create, to create creatine phosphate, and we have an enzyme that does that. So, but when you're needing more ATP, we can take that phosphate group off of creatine phosphate, stick it onto ADP, and uh, form ATP, and, uh, and thus have energy for a muscle contraction to occur. So at rest, we can take creatine, make it into, into um, creatine phosphate, and then when we need the energy, we can transfer the energy from ATP to, um, from, a, from the creatine phosphate to ATP and uh, use that energy for muscle contraction. We also have another way called the anaerobic glycolysis pathway. This is where we generate ATP. Um, this is where, as ATP and creatine phosphate are exhausted, ATP is going to be generated by the breakdown of glucose in the process called glycolysis. Um, you can break down stored um, glucose from muscle glycogen. You can break muscle glycogen down into glucose molecules, or you can absorb it through the bloodstream and use it from the bloodstream. So in glycolysis, glucose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvic acid or pyruvate. And in intense exercise, these molecules of pyruvic acid are converted into lactic acid because you don't have oxygen available to further break it down. And it's released into the bloodstream. That lactic acid will be released into the bloodstream. Your liver will take that lactic acid, convert it into pyruvic acid or convert it into glucose so we can use it for energy. Now, as you produce lactic acid, it does change the pH of the muscle cell. It decreases the pH or makes the muscle cell interior more acidic. And uh, that can be a problem for sustaining a contraction for a really long period of time. ATP is liberated, quick, liberated quickly in this process, but you, you can generate very little of it um, uh, compared to a, another pathway called the aerobic pathway, where you use oxygen to liberate more energy. The amount of available energy liberated by the uh, anaerobic pathway is between 60 and 120 seconds worth of, of, um, of energy. So, you, you know, so sprinters are going to use this anaerobic uh, pathway, um, but, you know, after a period of time, their muscles won't have enough ATP to sustain uh, a continued contraction. And that's where we move over into the aerobic pathway. So at rest and at moderate exercise, 95% of your ATP is going to be generated from aerobic respiration. And uh, this is slow uh, to make ATP molecules, and it requires lots of fuel and lots of oxygen in order to occur. This aerobic pathway is going to occur in your mitochondria, your little powerhouses. And this process releases carbon dioxide as a waste product, a little bit of water, and large and large, super large amounts of ATP. So as exercise begins, your glucose is provided by muscle glycogen. Shortly after that, blood-borne glucose um, and pyruvic acid from glycolysis, uh, also free fatty acids, are going to be the fuels that are going to run this process. After 30 minutes, fatty acids are going to be the predominant way that we supply energy. So if you do want to reduce down fats in your body, you really have to exercise for an extended period of time so that fatty acids become the major fuel and uh, they're reduced inside of your cells and bloodstream. So this is just showing you the, um, that uh, um, creatine phosphate can only sustain contraction for a short period of time um, and, uh, and give you energy for a short period of time. The anaerobic pathway or glyco glycolytic pathway also doesn't last for very long, but aerobic respiration can continue and it's to, to, can continue to supply ATP for long periods of time, uh, and that's what we use for um, muscles that maintain our posture and for muscles that we use for aerobic activities. And this is just a graphic showing you some of the different uh, pathways that are utilized. Um, so here we use the creatine phosphate, here we're utilizing the uh, anaerobic respiration, and over here we're using aerobic respiration to release ATP. So we do have different systems that use um, different uh, different 
exercises use different energy generating systems. So creatine phosphate um, system, you know, weightlifting, diving, sprinting, stuff that's short in duration, but using huge contractive force, we're going to use that particular system. The anaerobic system, you know, tennis, soccer, and 100 meter swim, something where you're, 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 um, you're having contractions over longer periods of time, but not for super long periods of time, you know, 30 seconds or less. The aerobic systems, you're looking at marathon runs, jogging, and then just your postural muscles um, that maintain postures. Your posture is going to use the uh, aerobic system. Now, if you notice this diagram here, this diagram shows you that if you stain muscle cells for certain kinds of characteristics, that there are different kinds of muscle cells. So you can see there is this muscle cell, this muscle cell, and then there is the, uh, the this muscle cell here. So there are three kinds of muscle cells that we're going to study in, uh, in this class. Their names are named differently depending upon what textbook you use, but slow oxidative, fast oxidative glycolytic, and fast glycolytic uh, will be the different names that they, um, that they have. So this is showing you uh, just a transverse section of muscle tissue, showing you the different fibers that are there. Yeah, so look at your study guide and know how much you have to know from this. But uh, if you look at the different kinds of um, of muscle cells, we have uh, we have muscle cells that are used for sprinting. So we have um, fast glycolytic. They're also known as type 2B, and uh, they're used for sprinting. They have uh, you know when we look at the motor unit size, two to six fibers uh, per 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 uh, motor unit. Um, they have uh, very fast ATPase ACE activity. This is an enzyme that breaks down ATP to release it very fast and use it uh, for muscle contractions. They have um, their contraction speed is very fast. They're very they have very very low resistance to fatigue though, so they don't last for very long. They have very little ability to store uh, myoglobin or oxygen. Um, they don't have a lot of capillaries. They're actually white in color because of lack of capillaries. They have enzymes to do glycolysis. They're very high in those, and they have very sparse amounts of mitochondria. So that's what sprinters have. When you look at uh, kind of an intermediate fast oxidative, an intermediate type of muscle fiber, you're looking at muscle fibers that are used for walking. They have two to six muscle fibers per uh, motor unit, lots of ATPase. Uh, activity for fast breakdown of ATP. Contraction, contraction speed is fast. Um, they have an intermediate level of resistance to, uh, to fatigue. High myoglobin, so they do store lots of oxygen. Um, intermediate levels of capillaries, so a little bit more blood supply. They are red. They have intermediate levels of gly, uh, glycolytic enzymes for glycolysis, and they have intermediate levels of, of uh, mitochondria. And then your slow oxidative, these are ones that are going to be using aerobic respiration for long, intense uh, periods of contraction. They have 100 uh, or so uh, plus uh, fibers, uh, mu muscle fibers per um, motor, um, motor unit or motor uh, um, axon. They have low ATPase activity. They have slow contraction speed, high rates, high resistance to fatigue, so we can use those for long periods of time. High myoglobin content, so lots of oxygen, lots of capillaries to feed those muscle cells. They're red, and they have low glycolytic enzymes and uh, packed with mitochondria. So we use different kinds of muscle fibers for different kinds of activities. And these muscle fibers can convert themselves into other muscle fibers, depending upon the kinds of uh, training that you do. Muscle fatigue is pretty complex. It's the physiological inability to contract a muscle cell, and its causes are many. You know, so really it's the com combination of all these things I'm talking about that leads to muscle fatigue. So you can have ionic imbalances of potassium, calcium, and inorganic phosphate. So if you break down a lot of ATP, you have a lot of inorganic phosphate that's inside the cell, and that will interfere with the excitation contraction coupling that'll interfere with the action potential coming in and the contraction occurring. Prolonged exercise so, so can sometimes damage sarcoplasmic reticulum. It interferes with the release of calcium that causes fatigue. Inadequate release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Depletion of oxygen and nutrients. Buildup of lactic acid which changes the pH. Buildup of ADP. All of these are signals that will cause muscles to begin to fatigue. 
So an insufficient release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction can also cause muscle fatigue as well. Lactic acid is also involved in psychological fatigue. Psychological fatigue is where you get sore muscles that feel tired or, or feel painful, and that will cause uh, you know, a person to give up on a physical activity. So what happens after exercise? Well, lactic acid has to be converted to pyruvic acid. We have to get rid of that lactic acid out of the muscle cell. We have to take and, and, uh, and replenish our glycogen stores. So we take glucose from the bloodstream and build glycogen from that and store it in glycosomes. ATP and, and creatine phosphate are going to um, uh, be resynthesized and remade and stored. Oxygen reserves so that myoglobin will be um, will, will, will take and, and um, stick more oxygen onto that and, and we'll uh, replenish that. And then if we have damage because of the activity that we did, the satellite cells, those little cells that are sitting around the muscle cells, they'll help to repair damaged cells. All of this occurs after we exercise. So we do have to have a period of time where we rest so we can um, recharge those muscle cells. If you look here, this is a, a muscle cell that had some kind of a myotrauma uh, occur to it. We have the activation of the satellite cells. They'll actually join with and fuse with the muscle cell and thus repair them and, uh, and, uh, and become a resting uh, muscle fiber again. So those are, are really, that's a really cool ability that they have. Muscle fibers, though, don't have the ability to, um, to go through cell division. So therefore, they have to repair themselves. So if you kill a muscle cell, it doesn't, it doesn't grow like there's no new muscle cells that grow. But muscle cells that are there can grow in size to maybe replace some of the activity that we now have lost from a dead muscle cell. There are many adaptations you can have if you do prolonged muscle uh, uh, prolonged exercise. You can increase your number of capillaries that surround the muscle fibers, thus building like um, roads, new roads that bring new nutrients and new oxygen into the muscle cells. You can increase the number of mitochondria, which helps you to make more ATP. You can make more myoglobin, which helps you store more oxygen. Um, and uh, you can develop better um, um, glycogen storage ability. Uh, depending upon the exercise, your muscles may hypertrophy. If you do exercises that are that are um, that are like weightlifting, you can actually grow this muscle cell, um, and that's called hypertrophy. Uh, I'll lastly con uh, kind of conclude this lecture with talking about muscular dystrophy. This is a group of inherited uh, muscle destroying diseases. It's where the muscles enlarge due to fat and connective tissue deposits. Um, the, so the people with muscular dystrophy will actually look like they have big muscles, but it's because of the connective tissue and fat that's deposited in them. The muscle fibers will actually atrophy and degenerate. Um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is the most common and severe type of muscular dystrophy. It is a sex-linked trait, so it's carried on the X chromosome, and it's where a person is not going to be able to make that dystrophin protein. Um, Victims will become clumsy and, and fall frequently. They usually die of respiratory failure in their 20s because of the lack of the ability to control um, the muscle contraction of the diaphragm. So uh, symptoms include fatigue, muscle weakness, progressive difficulty walking. There's no known cure to this particular disease. And I just wanted to refresh your memory that, you know, the dystrophin is the protein that will connect the uh, the um, the myofibrils to the sarcolemma. So if you have a, a a problem with this dystrophin, then you can't connect the myofibrils and the shortening of the myofibrils with the sarcolemma. Therefore, the muscle cell won't contract. The myofibrils will contract, but the muscle the cell membrane won't be pulled on, thus causing a pull on a tendon. And, uh, you know, between 30 and 50 years of age, 10% of our muscle tissue is replaced by fibrous connective tissue and adipose tissue. Between 50 and 80 years of age, 40% of our muscle tissue is replaced. The consequences of that are we lose strength and flexibility, uh, our reflex is slow, and uh, our slow oxidative uh, fiber numbers um, will actually increase. So we'll have a decrease in the other muscle fibers. So, you know, if, as you age, it's important that you eat lots of protein, lots of nutrients, and that you exercise 
and that you do things like yoga, flexibility, um, exercises, calisthenics, you know, things that increase aerobic activity, but also muscle, um, you know, muscle exercises that use weights um, so that you can help to diminish the loss of these uh, muscle fibers over time. Okay, well, that's the second part of the muscle lecture. And, uh, you know, if you have questions, please make sure you email them to me or feel free to ask in class. But you will need to spend some time in your book reading these sections and also looking at your notes and, and uh, doing your study guide. So be a great student. Do everything you need to do to, to make the grade that you want to make in this class. So until next time, I will see you later.